Okay, well, hello everyone, and it's nice to uh, virtually be here. It always feels strange to be doing a webinar where you can't see anyone that's participating, but we truly appreciate your time and your enthusiasm for the topic. Uh, and we're, we're very thankful uh, for the invitation as well, as well to be here. So uh, my name is Kate Story. I'm an implementation scientist in the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. Uh, my research focus is on school and community-based strategies to promote healthy weights and prevent chronic diseases. And uh, one such strategy that I work with is, is comprehensive school health, but certainly um, work with a number of school communities. And I use the term school community loosely to mean uh, homeschool and community across Canada. And my name is Noreen Willows. I'm a colleague of Kate's story. We're working together in Alberta on the uh, Aboriginal Youth Mentorship Program. I'm a community nutritionist in the Department of Agricultural Food and Nutritional Science at the University of Alberta. And although I'm not an Indigenous person myself, my research focus for the for more than 20 years now has been um, nutrition interventions and nutrition research in First Nations communities in Canada. And I'm very happy to be here today to share the project with you. So today we are going to be talking about the Aboriginal or Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program. And uh, the reason for uh, the multiple names is that some communities we're working in prefer the name Aboriginal Youth Mentorship Program, which was uh, the original name and others prefer the Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program. So at times I may say AYMP or IYMP, but um, I will try to not use acronyms otherwise throughout. So um, the, the AYMP or IYMP is a 90 minute uh, once per week week after school peer-led health promotion program that's based on multi-age mentoring of early years elementary children and it varies by community but um, originally it was grade four students so ages nine to ten and mentored by high school students um, which can be early uh, middle school to high school so grades seven to twelve and ages 14 to 19 with a goal of reducing the risk factors for type 2 diabetes. So children in the program receive a healthy snack, participate in physical activities, and participate in communal relationship uh, building activities that include cultural teaching. So um, today we're talking about uh, AYMP. We'll get into the details later. We're going to start with a little bit of uh, context. Um, but AYMP started in Manitoba and it has been rippling across the country. So um, now in Alberta, we'll be talking a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the picture on the first slide here, um, this picture uh, was taken at the Canadian Museums for Human Rights in Winnipeg when we had our first meeting in August 2016 um, between uh, researchers and Indigenous community partners as um, the rippling, we were discussing the rippling of the uh, Aboriginal Youth Mentorship Program to Indigenous communities across Canada. So the program is being implemented in Indigenous school communities across Canada, including in First Nations um, communities in Alberta. And uh, we're very excited about that. So before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 7 territory and that... Oh, Treaty 6, sorry, I was, I, I was moving across the country. Uh, we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. And we're also very grateful to CIHR, Diabetes Canada, PolicyWise for Children and Families, and the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation in supporting the AEIYMP that we will discuss today. So if we go on to the next slide, um, the Aboriginal Youth uh, Mentorship Project has as one of its aims um, the reduction of type 2 diabetes in participants. Why is that the case? We know that in Canada, 44% of children who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes are of Indigenous heritage. I mean, the fact that we're even seeing this disease in any child um, is of serious concern. It used to be called adult onset diabetes. Now we're seeing it in children. And as I said, with a preponderance of those children being of Indigenous heritage. The reasons for, the reasons for this higher prevalence are complex, but are tied to lack of access to nutritious and economical foods in many communities, low physical activity levels, and we can't disregard the effects of colonial policies. So schools are important settings for diabetes prevention interventions. 
Um, two such interventions that have been published in the literature are the Ganawagi School Diabetes Prevention Project that has occurred in a Mohawk community near to Montreal and the Sandy Lake Health and Diabetes Project in Northern Ontario. So these two landmark community-based participatory studies targeting diabetes prevention among First Nations children in Canada help to guide the ethical space and governance of our current Aboriginal Youth Mentorship Project research team. And building on Noreen's comments uh, from the last slide, when looking at how to best approach interventions to address type 2 diabetes uh, with youth, we really need to acknowledge that prevention is key and that true primary prevention and working upstream is, is necessary. So here is an image here, I'm not gonna go into detail, but this can be seen as illustrated by the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. So uh, for example, looking at building healthy public policy and creating supportive environments to name a few. So when we're, when we're working with children and youth, we're working with, with communities, we truly need to make the healthy choice, the easy choice uh, where children live, learn and play and that can really allow youth to benefit overall. So moving on, one upstream approach that uh, has been used is a mentorship, pro is a mentorship uh, model, which has been proven effective. So I'm again, not gonna go into significant detail of this study, but um, some of you may be able to access it. If not, the abstract is there for future viewing. Uh, this study was published in 2014 in JAMA Pediatrics and assess the effectiveness of a school-based, peer-led healthy living program that was called Healthy Buddies. So it was a 10 month long program. Um, in this specific paper, it was 19 elementary schools in Manitoba uh, participated in which lesson plans were delivered by older elementary students to their younger peers. Uh, and the lesson plans included physical activity, healthy eating, self-esteem and body image. So the older kids were paired with younger kids um, in which the older kids taught the lesson later in the week. And the intervention showed that there was a significant reduction in waist circumference and uh, amongst the older students, a significant improvement in knowledge of healthy eating, physical activity, uh, self-reported food and drink intake and self-esteem. And this provided much of the rationale for the Aboriginal Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program. As well, when looking uh, at more detail of the uh, data from this study, so the Healthy Buddies study in Manitoba, it showed that the effects of the intervention, so the peer mentoring intervention, were even more promising for First Nations youth. So another thing to consider uh, when working with school communities uh, on developing or implementing diabetes prevention programs is that we must consider the social, economic and health inequities uh, and they should be taken into consideration. So such interventions need to address the social determinants of health, for example, such as income and education and truly take a strengths based approach. So strengths based approaches value the capacity, the skills, the knowledge, the connections and the potential in both the individuals and communities. So another factor that um, individuals may want to consider when they're developing interventions is using a multi-level approach. And if we look at this slide, it shows a socio-ecological framework to understand weight-related issues in Aboriginal children. Um, I developed this model with my colleagues, Anthony Hanley and Trina Delormier. Um, it's available for anyone to download um, from the Journal of Applied Physiology, Nutrition and Metabolism. The importance of a socio-ecological socio framework is that it can be used when planning diabetes prevention interventions to ensure that approaches consider the social determinants of health, such as childhood education and historical factors. So for example, on the very outer ring of this socio-ecological framework, you can see that in Indigenous communities, it would be important to address colonization by Europeans, dispossession of traditional lands, and assimilation policies. So this particular model, which can be used to address weight-related issues, diabetes, and other health um, issues affecting children, highlights that interventions directed only at the individual level, which is that very inner ring, uh, will be less successful than multi-level interventions that try to change the physical and policy environments 
within which people live. So for example, the community school environment. So the Ganawagi School Diabetes Prevention Project, which I mentioned previously, applied a socio-ecological design that targeted multiple aspects of the community to promote and support healthy eating change among children. So as Noreen mentioned, uh, when working in communities, decolonizing approaches are truly needed to address uh, trans the transgenerational stress, such as loss of culture, language, land, and residential schools. And I have an image up on the screen that is from the artist, writer, and jewelry designer, Jawano Gishik, which um, in Ojibwe means Southern White Cedar. Uh, and Jawano's designs draw on the oral and pictorial traditions. And as you can see his description here of the Midwomen Life Road. He describes the teachings of the Midwomen and how each person has a path to follow. So the true path of life. And the jewelry he created using this image is called Mino Bamadazwin or the way of the good life. And so the reason I'm showing this image is that a key component of the mentorship program we're talking about today um, and how it is a decolonizing approach is that it is that ARA or IYMP truly works to promote the way of the good life. And so it's something that we keep um, at the front of our minds as we're moving um, and working with school communities. So Kate and I have now given you a little bit of a, a background about um, how frameworks can be established to help prevent uh, diabetes in children through inter interventions by focusing on the social determinants of health, by using so social ecological models. Um, now we want to get to the heart of the matter. So how are we doing this work to prevent diabetes in Indigenous children? Um, students are at the heart, at the centre of our work. We care about children and youth holistically, ensuring that they have the best chance to succeed. So if we go on to the next slide, the um, Aboriginal or Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program is, as Kate said, decolonizing. It is based on peer mentorship, considers the social determinants of health, such as childhood development, and addresses type two diabetes prevention. Decolonization, for those of you who aren't familiar with the word who, or who don't know exactly what it means, has been described as restoring the Indigenous worldview, restoring culture and traditional ways, and replacing Western interpretations of history with Indigenous perspectives of history. Now Kate is going to tell you more about the AYMP. So these are two publications that appeared in the last year in the PHE journal, um, but I'm going to summarize them a little bit and, and how AYMP began and its origins. So it, it did not start in Alberta, it started in Manitoba and, and Joni Hallis in 2014 planted seeds um, in one with one Indigenous youth that was interested in participating in a participatory action research project. Um, that relationship grew and it then started, the program then started as Rec and Read in 2005, I believe is the date. Um, the project continued in urban school communities and was then adapted in and around 2010 for delivery in the North as part of a, a provincial and nationally funded uh, research project in Northern Manitoba. Um, in 2013, 2016 expansion um, included five Ojibwe, Métis and Cree communities in rural Manitoba, and that was funded by CIHR. And over the past five years in that time period, the efficacy, uh, researchers worked to establish the efficacy of, of AYMP. Uh, and then in 2016, and the reason why you have Noreen and I here today was that um, A or IYMP expanded to 13 communities, which is the um, uh, the rural and remote component and then the rec and read program in urban uh, communities in Manitoba continues to run as well. So uh, a little bit of history and uh, about about this mentorship project. So here is um, a summary that appeared in uh, Joni's and, and colleagues paper in 2017. Uh, talking about what AYMP is and how AYMP promotes the good life or living in a good way with a vision to reduce health and education inequities amongst Canadian youth and really focusing on uh, communal relationship building. 
So how is that accomplished? So um, you can see here the circle of courage um, that is uh, the image of the circle of courage, which is beautifully drawn and focusing on resilience as a path to wellness is what uh, the ARIYMP is based on uh, the theoretical framework. So that means that building on the strengths and enthusiasm and experience of youth and those in the community. So um, I'm going to read uh, from Joni's article because uh, I know many of you might not be able to access it and in terms of how did they achieve a sense of belonging in the program. So quoting, quoting the article, it says, through respect for ourselves, each other, the children, our ideas in the program. She asked, how did we achieve mastery? By identifying activities that were relevant, again, for ourselves, each other, the children, and our aspirations in the program. How do we promote independence? By shifting responsibility for the program success to our youth mentors. In generosity, the program is founded on the reciprocity shared between all participants by giving of ourselves in the mentorship program. In whatever responsibilities we assume each day, we are also receiving. We are uplifted by the smiles and joy on the faces of the children. We develop our own intercultural leadership skills and we acquire new friendships that expand our social networks in tangible ways. So I think that's a nice summary of um, how the A or I Y M P functions and how resilience is truly a path to wellness. In terms of this approach, I mentioned the expansion um, that occurred in um, Northern Manitoba. So this is this is a publication that established the effectiveness or the success of the program. So 151 children in the Garden Hill First Nation uh, took part in the five month peer led intervention. And what it showed in terms of health outcomes was that there was a significant change in waist circumference for those that participated in the intervention. As well, there was also improvements in the knowledge of healthy eating. So again, there's a summary here on this slide that you can look to and access as an abstract, because I know many of you wouldn't have access to the peer review publication. So we want to point out uh, for those of you who are interested, and I'm sure most of you are, in evidence-based practice, that you can go to the Public Health Agency of Canada website and look up interventions that are considered um, best practices. So this is the Canadian Best Practices Portal. So like the Ganawagi School Diabetes Prevention Program, KSDPP, that I introduced earlier, the Aboriginal Youth Mentorship Program is also on the Public Health Agency of Canada's Best Practices Portal, recognizing its success as a public health program. Um, so this was the uh, uh, first iteration of the AYMP. As we'll discuss, it's being rolled out or rippled to other communities um, to see what it looks like when applied in other settings. Um, so uh, please um, read about us, the, the first iteration of it, NKSDDP and any other programs that may be of value to you as you're thinking of going forward to build a mentorship program. So what this water um, is implying is that um, the AYMP, the Aboriginal or Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program, is now being rippled or spread across Canada to Indigenous school communities based on its early success. Um, now what we're trying to do is um, assess what does it look like when it goes to other communities and what are the outcomes that we'll see when communities take ownership of it and apply it uniquely in their own school community setting. So you can see here a map um, looking at where the communities are located um, that are now part of the Aboriginal or Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program family. Um, the communities aren't identified on this map, instead just by, by province. And so um, you can see the rippling that has occurred and we use the term rippling as opposed to scale up uh, due to preference of, of community um, and AIYMP partners uh, as part of as part of our AIYMP family. So, um, and as Nori mentioned previously, we're trying to understand now that this has expanded across the country, uh, what does that look like? And can we continue to um, learn from the experience mm -hmm. given different contexts and settings? 
Okay, so here's a lovely picture of uh, children um, who are part of the AYMP playing, getting together, having a good time, enjoying themselves. So exactly what does the Aboriginal Youth Mentorship Program look like? In part, what it looks like depends on what the communities want it to look like, although as Kate's going to describe in a little bit, uh, there are essential components to the program um, that make it similar across settings. Um, so what we want to do for you now is describe what the program looks like on the ground in the school communities that it's been rippled to. Um, Kate's going to go on to the next slide. We had hoped to show a video, but I'm not sure if that's possible. <laughs> So we have a lovely YouTube video. <laughs> I can't click on it, it will, it will pop up. It'll pop up, but it won't play. Oh. Through to them. It'll play for us, but they won't be able to hear it. So oh. We can oh. send it out to the manager. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we will, send, we will send the link because it's really a lovely video uh, in which youth are participating, mentors are talking about the value that they have, the importance of mentorship to them. And I think Noreen and I could probably sit here all day uh, trying to tell you about mentorship and what AYMP means to the mentors and the youth um, and we wouldn't be nearly as successful as this video. So uh, I really strongly encourage you, we will send out the link to watch this video because it's way more powerful than um, our talking heads here uh, describing it. So um, that that is the video that you don't get to see. Uh, it's great. I hope you, you take our word for it and, and watch it. Um, and certainly there's a lot of pride in everyone participating. So that's a summary mm -hmm. of the video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Noreen. Okay, yeah, so that, that video is, it's only two minutes long and the, the music is rocking. <laughs> it has really yes, great music. Tribe Called Red in the background. Yeah, so. A Tribe yeah. Called Red, really great music. So uh, yeah, watch that video when, we, when the link gets sent out, it's fantastic. So here's another picture of um, children getting together. Um, one of the essential um, underlying premises of the Aboriginal Youth uh, Mentorship Program is that it's both relationship and community driven. So the communities are in the driver's seat. Um, community drives decisions. This is what makes it decolonizing as a program. Um, communities, although activities are an important part of it, what activities get done with children is determined by the community. Although cultural teachings are to occur, what those teachings look like and how they're taught to children is up to the community. Although a healthy SNAP program is part of the program, the communities get to make decisions about what those snacks will be and how they get served. So that's a key element, we don't tell communities uh, what activities um, they should undertake, what snacks they should serve, or which teaching should happen, rather the communities are in control. Okay, so we've provided a lot of background, but what does this actually look like on the ground specifically? And if you were looking to implement a type of program like this, what would it look like? So as Noreen mentioned, it's it's community-based, community-driven, resilience-centered. So that means that uh, while mentorship is at the um, central core of this, it can look very different in every different school community. So I have in here, we have in here that it's peer-led after-school program, but for example, in one of the communities in Canada, it's actually during school. So that's an example of how it's community-based and community-driven. Uh, it's delivered by Indigenous high school students. And again, because dri driven by the community, there are some communities in which there are junior high, um, junior mentors that are participating as well uh, for their elementary aged peers. Um, the starting point is that it's once a week for 90 minutes for 20 minutes or for 20 weeks. Uh, but certainly many of our communities, again, have chosen uh, for the project to run um, all all winter long. So starting in January, going to the end of June. And in fact, I think most of the, the communities, um, that's been a preference. But this is where the starting point for a conversation was um, and communities adapt based on what they see as the strength, again, a strengths-based approach, what they see as the strength and working with um, 
working with their school communities to figure out what works for them. So uh, the elementary aged peers, um, I mentioned grade four, but sometimes it's grade five, the grade threes might be involved as well, just depending on, on what works there. And the high school students sometimes are in the same school, sometimes are not. So obviously some logistics of um, transportation can be an issue. Uh, sometimes we shift the schedule just based on starting in the fall as opposed to starting in the winter, if that works better for the school community. Um, but certainly logistics are an incredibly important part of any um, school program or school-based program. And that's where the flexibility of A or IYMP um, is beneficial in that we can work with the school communities and build on their strengths. So there are core components of, of A or IYMP. But communal relationship building is, is one part. So as Noreen mentioned, um, this, the, the children and youth typically come to the mentorship program. Um, what I'll mention on the next slide is the staffing, but prior to the program being delivered, which is once a week, whichever day it works in the school community, uh, the high school mentors meet together to plan what this 90 minute um, session is going to look like that's offered once a week. And what those high school students do is together with what I'll describe on the next slide of a young adult health leader who helps to guide them. They determine what snacks will be served, um, who's going to prepare the snacks, who's going to purchase the snacks, what physical activity is going to happen, and then what type of sharing circle or communal relationship building it, it is also going to happen. So you can see here, this picture is from um, our national gathering that took place in Kananaskis in 2007, or November 2017. And this is one example of an activity that, that one can do with, with the youth. So um, the YALS and the mentors receive training on different types of physical activities that they can do. Um, I know there are some traditional games that are used, games in the gym. So sometimes it's just a pickup game of basketball. Other times it might be different forms of tag, I know has been quite popular. Um, um, it just depends on what the youth are interested in. And so we work with the mentors to ensure that they're listening to the youth and that the youth are saying, this is great, or we want to spend more time outside. That's maybe what the physical activity looks like. Um, the young adult health leaders and the mentors also receive uh, a bit knowledge about what healthy snacks are. And so we try to work that into uh, the after school program as well and in talking to the mentees about what does a healthy snack look like. So those are the core components. Again, the high school mentors are working with a y'all who are described to plan the activity. Then once a week, 90 minutes a week, that the mentorship program is delivered to the younger students. It includes the relationship building, healthy snack and physical activity. But who is involved in actually doing this? So there's an individual called a young adult health leader or what we call a y'all. Um, and that person, there's one person in each community to help guide, support, and mentor the high school students, as well as to help um, in some ways uh, recruit high school students to be mentors. So uh, we recognize that sometimes it's a challenge to be a high school student mentor and to deliver a mentorship program to younger, to younger children. And so the all really functions as another level of mentorship um, to help to help run the program. So the young adult health leaders, you can see some of them here. This was um, at uh, training uh, for the young adult health leaders this past summer. Um, they're having fun doing some swimming while also learning about the program and the project. Um, and so the young adult health leader would attend all of the planning sessions with the high school student mentors, as well as the actual after school program uh, for the mentees or the younger students. So uh, you can see here the staffing needs include the young adult health leader as well as the high school students as mentors to uh, who plan and implement AYMP and mentor the younger children. In each community, the number of mentors varies. Um, sometimes it's a very strong, um, strong and a uh, small group of mentors, and sometimes it's lots of mentors that share in share in the responsibilities. So um, these are some of the key people. Obviously, um, the school we work quite closely with the school principal and other school staff and teachers and uh, anyone else in the school community um, that can be that that is invested in this in this project. 
Um, certainly, I know Noreen's going to talk a little bit about um, some of the steps and some of the space that's necessary, um, but here are some of the people that uh, are helpful. Yeah, so here's just uh, a basic summary of some of the uh, steps of running the Aboriginal Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program. High school mentors meet um, to plan 90 minutes of activity that uh, typically will take place after school. That includes snacks, some sort of physical activity or game and cultural teachings. Um, and we haven't really mentioned it, but um, they were trained, the, um, the adult, um, uh, the y'alls, young, uh, young adult uh, health leaders were um, trained um, to help high school mentors to think about these different activities. High school mentors prepare the snacks uh, for the after school program, set up the activity areas, uh, run the activities and then uh, clean up afterwards. So it gives them ownership, um, you know, it, the, the program relies on them to, to run it and to, to keep it going, uh, probably gives individuals a sense of pride. Um, the young adult health leaders from the community and the high school mentors review the day's events together, what's going to happen, they may debrief. Um, so just to let you know, I mean, this is really loose. Um, you know, because the communities have so much ownership, what uh, Kate and I are doing with our colleagues across Canada now is try to see when the program is run this way, what does it look like? Uh, so we're doing outcome evaluation. For example, even though it looks differently in different settings, do we see similar outcomes, for example, such as an impact on weight status? Um, an impact on how children feel about themselves. That's really important to us. It, it's as important as the weight status. Um, we're also doing a process evaluation to see how many children attend these programs. So who is it serving? Um, how many young adult health leaders are involved? How many high school mentors are involved? Um, which components of the uh, program um, get taught? What sort of fidelity is there? So this is where the implementation science comes in, the whole messiness of it uh, that Kate has expertise in. And we have um, graduate students involved, and I'm, I'm very grateful to Policy Wise for Children and Family, um, who's supporting one of my PhD students to do this work. There's also um, a master's student um, at the University of Alberta, um, who I'm supervising and Kate's on, on both of my graduate students' committees. So we'll have qualitative and quantitative data at the end of this that can give us a picture of this rippling. And hopefully that will help um, con convince funders and to convince individual communities of the merit of uh, applying this sort of a, a mentoring approach to an after-school program. So if you would like to do something like this, what do you need? So the next slide talks about the, the basic program needs of the Aboriginal Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program. Um, obviously, you need a, a room um, to conduct activities. It has to be big enough and uh, a safe place to play games and to hold group conversations, either inside or outside of the school. Um, you have to have physical activity equipment, although, I mean, activities could be as simple as tags so it doesn't have to be really complicated or really expensive and hopefully the um, high school mentors would know um, their community enough to know the sorts of games uh, that children like and what activities are possible and then a healthy snack program um, obviously high school mentors would need some assistance in knowing what is and is not a healthy snack and then in indigenous settings um, perhaps the cooperation uh, of an elder or the inclusion of an elder, I should say, um, who can give guidance on what appropriate cultural teachings are mm -hmm. um, to share um, with the group as a whole or with the high school mentors or the young adult health leaders so that cultural teachings can take place. Um, so it's not a lot. There's not a huge expense involved. And... Um, 
yeah, mostly it's ownership by the community of the program and just a, a willingness to, on a weekly basis, get together and run the program. So if we go to the next slide, um, we're kind of wrapping up. Um, Kate may want to say a little bit uh, more if we've forgotten anything, but uh, Kate and I definitely want, you, want to thank you for attending today. Um, the next slide provides you with our contact information if you would like to get a hold of us. Here is a picture of the team uh, that has rippled across the country, uh, taken during our national gathering in November 2017. So you can uh, look at the first slide um, that showed our meeting in Winnipeg in August uh, 2016. And already it seems like we've done so much in such a short period of time and it's taken momentum and we have a, a terrific team and everyone's highly motivated and it's been a fantastic experience to work together on this project. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would like to add is that Noreen and I are just two of very, um, <laughs> of many individuals that are in, involved in, in the project. The, the, um, the expansion of, of AYMP, I mentioned Joni Hallis starting it. Uh, the expansion is, is led by John McGavick at University of Manitoba. Certainly we have partners all across Canada in terms of, of academics as well as community members, community co-investigators, uh, knowledge users, and we're still learning. Um, I think that uh, I always, whenever I'm talking, I always say we're trying to remain curious. And so we've known that um, this is worthwhile and beneficial and it's worked. And certainly the voices of the youth are powerful. And I think that's why I stress the video so much. Um, but we're really trying to understand from an evidence-based perspective, what this looks like in terms of as we ripple across the country, what can we learn from different contexts and settings? And so I'd very much like to stress that we're still on the curiosity learning path. Um, we're still trying to understand what that looks like. I certainly really enjoy reading the, the logs that uh, we receive, basically tracking what's happening um, in all of the different 13 communities and how different um, that is and how we can celebrate the differences across communities, but that we still have this common um, core uh, in terms of, of what we're doing. So in that um, resilience-focused, decolonizing, community-based, strengths-based, um, and really how we are looking at outcome measures, but uh, the power is often in, in the, with the mentors and the comments and the, the um, discussions that you have with mentors and how much this means to them to be seen as, you know, quote unquote, a teacher or a role model for their younger peers in the community. So um, those stories are, I think, what keeps us all going going forward. And I think it's it's really wonderful to be in the communities watching it run. Um, and the pictures have highlighted some of that, all the smiling faces. So um, obviously this is the team, the, there's some youth in there, but um, the previous pictures where you can see um, not specifically faces of children, we were very conscious of that, but um, you know, the faces and the experiences of the youth uh, across Canada. So I think that's all I want to add. So thank you all for attending. Well, and thank you very much for sharing. And at this time, we'll go to your question. So Corey, uh, uh, just throw something in the chat box. Do we, uh, if you have any questions, you can you can type them in at the moment. And and I have just a couple. Um, I I was curious if you could expand on the impact that this program has had, not just on the mentees, but on the mentors themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's one of the key pieces that we're really focused on understanding right now of of talking to the mentors themselves about what this has has. Has, what this has meant to them. So we're still very much with this expansion uh, in the middle of it. So we're, we're still looking to those questions. Um, certainly, I know Noreen has a student, uh, Sabrina, she's doing her PhD, and she has been very focused on looking at the y'alls and the mentors um, of what this means to them. Um, in, in some communities, we're also using um, a, a questionnaire that basically asks, how are you? So looking looking to that to see if this is, has impacted them over time. Um, and I know some of our colleagues are on the call about that, but we're, we, we definitely understand that it is as important, if not potentially, you never know, more important, right? Uh, of their role as leaders in the community and really fostering that sense of leadership. And I know in some of the uh, communities in Manitoba, 
um, some of the students that were, or I think there's one specific example of a student that was a mentor that became a young adult health leader. And then another, you know, it, it even created more leadership opportunities in the community. And those, those stories we're hoping to capture. Um, I'm a qualitative researcher primarily. And so I'm very interested in the stories, um, you know, uh, behind the numbers in a sense. And so uh, working by looking at sharing circles, by using arts-based approaches such as photo voice to understand what AYMP means to mentors as well as mentees is very important to us to capture that. So mm -hmm. thank you for the question. Yeah. And Corey, we have a question from the audience. Yeah, uh, Shannon is wondering how would one get involved with the program expansion and have all of 13 communities been selected already? Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you want me to... Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so the thirteen communities uh, we've been the thirteen communities have been running since two thousand and sixteen, I believe. Um, I always try to. I'm not always the best with dates. Um, so we're in our second year of of implementing in most of the communities. So th those thirteen have been selected. However, um, what I will say is that we believe in this model and in this program, and so certainly we're looking at. Um, potential ways always of, of expanding this, both from a, a deepening perspective, maybe within um, provinces as well as a pan-Canadian perspective. So I would say that if you have interest, um, probably the best person to contact at this point uh, here is, is me and all my contact information is on the next slide. I can put it on there, so my email. It's just the picture is much nicer than text with email addresses and websites. Um, but you can certainly reach me at kate.story at ualberta.ca. Um, and if it's, if it's not, say, in Alberta, um, I can connect you with others involved in the ARIYMP um, to see about that, um, about e expansion and, and involvement. So mm -hmm. we're looking to that. We don't know yet. We're not at the point where it's, uh, you know, completely... Um, we're, we're still in very much a, a, a research stage, but we are hoping to to expand as well. I'm just curious about the other communities, if they have all been in uh, uh, rural settings or if you've had mm -hmm. any urban programs as mm -hmm. well. There is, there there are, so at Rec and Reed start, so in Manitoba it did start in an urban setting. There are other communities uh, as part of the rippling and the 13 of A or IYMP that are, are in urban communities, but I'm not going to. We don't want to, we didn't want to, we were very conscious not to identify any communities. Today. But, but yeah. the outcomes will speak to an applicability. Absolutely. To mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm, I was just curious, the, uh, before, before we started the webinar, we were talking about um, how 15% of the global GDP is mm. spent on treating downstream mm -hmm. uh, mm. costs related to obesity and, and, and uh, um, maladaptive health outcomes. And so we were we were talking about how we know, for example, that in mentoring programs, you can see um, kids who are more likely to do well academically or more likely to uh, be uh, be uh, avoid drugs and alcohol and bullying and all sorts of other negative behaviors. But one of the outcomes that you're certainly pointing to is that um, it can also save your life in, in another sense. It can, it can keep you healthier much longer. And, and mm -hmm. um, I just was wondering if you wanted to talk about the, the spectrum of outcomes that that you're looking at? Well, I'll just jump in, sure. and then Kate can jump in. I mean, it's well known that people who have um, good self-esteem are better able to practice health behaviors. You know, you're, you're more likely to say no to things that aren't good for you, to be receptive to positive behaviors, in part because you see that you have a good future. You know, you're more willing to take care of yourself and, uh, and respect your body if you have good self-esteem. So um, Kate can talk potentially about the tool, but one of the things that we're really interested in measuring are the, the positive um, outcomes that this program has on children's sense of, uh, of self and well-being. And I mean, certainly the obesity crisis worldwide um, isn't uh, completely due to people's lack of self-esteem. I mean, there's a it's, it's a, a tidal wave of uh, poor uh, food choices and sedentary lifestyles that's impacting us globally. But at the individual level, certainly um, giving people the tools to make healthy choices may enable them as they grow up to maintain a more healthy weight. So we're interested 
in um, some of these measures and, and Kate can maybe talk specifically about the tools. Yeah, so I, I believe uh, Marnie Anderson might be on the line, but Nancy Young and her team at Laurentian developed a tool called the Anishinaabe Yi or how are you? And so that is one tool we're looking at to see uh, about children's health or the Aboriginal children, child's health and well-being measures, another name for it, I believe. Uh, so that's one outcome. But I would say, I mean, I, I am biased because mm -hmm. I believe truly in true primary prevention um, and kind of have made my entire uh, work life as part of that, as well as my own personal life. But, um, you know, if we look at prevention efforts and, and, and I'm a school, you know, primarily I work with school communities. And so we know as well that healthy kids learn better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kids that are, are more physically active learn better. Kids that are fed learn better. Kids that have slept well learn better. So health and education are completely linked. And all of these other things are also linked to other, you know, mental health outcomes, physical health outcomes. So, um, you know, I, I've given talks before where I have kind of this web of all these relationships and I basically just put up, you know, a, a slide that it just looks like a bunch of scribbles because it's all it's mm -hmm. all related. And so um, I, I don't think we can discount that. And I think that, you know, we look at the social return on investment, the return on investment. Um, we can't afford, you know, the future health care costs if we don't prevent them mm -hmm. quite quite simply. Um, but also, you know, that's a very kind of um, deductive way of looking at it in terms of healthcare costs. Uh, but think of a child that's healthy and well their whole life versus a child that's not healthy and well their whole life. I mean, take away the healthcare costs, you know, which speaks a lot often um, to those in the public and public health, guy, economists. health economists and whatnot. <laughs> but, um, you know, you look at it, anyone that has a, has a child or a young person in their life um, that's healthy and well at five and then again at 10 and then again at 15. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just better, <laughs> you know? So I know that that doesn't always sell it, but I think that um, there, there is an increase in value put on primary prevention and on prevention. I think society has seen that. We just need to keep pushing that. Because I agree, the dollars aren't always attached. Uh, I am very familiar with dollars not always being attached to prevention programs, um, but it, we're getting there. And I think also in Indigenous communities, um, several uh, scholars, and I'm, sur I'm sure Indigenous people themselves will say that um, having a sense of pride and connection to your own culture is very health promoting. Um, it makes you feel good about yourself. It, it, give, it uh, lets you know who you are. It connects you to your community. And I think some of the, the teachings that were are integral to this program and also the inclusion of elders in many of the school communities really give kids a boost. It, it makes them feel good about themselves, about their community, about their culture. Um, in the qualitative interviews that uh, we're doing, we're actually asking about that. And, and that, that self-esteem um, and health-promoting attributes of this, I think people dis discount how important that is for me, people making good lifestyle choices. Yeah. The three, three of my favorite takeaways from your, your presentation about the, the essential elements of what you're doing that I think are applicable to someone, whether you're running a one-on-one -on -one Big Brothers Big Sisters mentoring program in, in Grand Prairie or, or an Indigenous school-based program in downtown Calgary, um, the three pieces that in, in the time together they had number one relationship building with some mm -hmm. intercultural component there and some 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 wisdom. Number two, the the healthy snack. And number three, the physical activity. I mean, these this these three walls of the triangle could be mm -hmm. uh, wonderful uh, to be integrated into any mentoring mm -hmm. relationship and just something to to think about more. Whether you're you're running in a, a specifically indigenous program or or mm -hmm. uh, you're running a, a program for new refugee Canadians, mm -hmm. these are all things that we can think about and be mindful of in mm -hmm. our and our mentoring work. So thank you for highlighting all of that. Yeah, and absolutely. And I mean, you say it as three and, and, and we have bullet points and it seems and it seems easy. I wanna stress that uh, it's not always easy. Um, logistics and implementation matter for sure. And so uh, it requires resources. And I know your, you know your organization is a great resource. Certainly I'm happy to, to link up with different resources. We're trying to create our own series of resources with, with AY and IYMP. Um, 
you know, you say, just get a healthy snack. Well, there's a lot of things involved in doing that, right? It's, it's, it's resourcing that from a cost perspective and access perspective. So food availability and accessibility is a very Mm -hmm. uh, difficult thing at times. Who's going to clean, Mm -hmm. cut and serve that? Mm -hmm. Uh, Who's going to clean up after? Don't pretend, you know, it sounds easy, but it is, it's, it's, it's not always that easy. Uh, Physical activity, uh, you know, working with the school community about logistics of the gym. Who's going to lock up and clean up afterwards? Who's going to ensure that the equipment doesn't go, you mm-hmm. know, walking off? Mm-hmm. Um, who's going to make sure that the kids get home? Who's going to make sure that the kids get there? So logistics of transportation can be an issue. So I, I'm not ending this on it. Uh, this isn't meant to be a negative note. It's mm-hmm. meant to be a positive note in that um, I never want a takeaway to be just do this. It's easy because it, it's, it's not always. But I think my message is always continue on the path. Um, reach out and maybe, you know, maybe if you can tackle one of those initially, then that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, with, with a goal, um, you know, if this is from a health promotion perspective with the goal of those three have worked really, really well. So I don't want people to get discouraged if they find that it's challenging, but certainly um, we talked about some of the logistics today. I'm happy to talk through or Noreen, I'm sure mm-hmm. or others uh, of how some of these things have come up because they have, and that's part of why we have national gatherings as well as um, we call them doors, but you know, Manitoba door, Western door, Eastern door meetings to talk about what's coming up in your community communities how can we share amongst one another and so I would say another key component and I found this in a lot of projects that I work with is the sharing across communities and across different sites so if you can establish that network um, you can problem solve much easier so you know I've had problems with parents not coming to pick up or guardians not coming to pick up what are things that you've done to address that how do you deal with um, busing you know, how do we how do we figure that? Have you had any success in forming partnerships with local grocers that are going to get rid of the produce anyways that we could we could take on? Mm-hmm. Um, so getting those relationships established early on is is often helpful, but it takes time. Mm-hmm. Definitely takes time. Well, we yeah. certainly look forward to hearing more about your learnings and and how we can help you in your in your rippling. I like that word, mm-hmm. rippling across uh, Canada. Mm-hmm. This is fantastic. Uh, Corey, I was wondering if you could just pull up for the viewers at home quickly uh, before we conclude. We have the teen mentoring toolkit that we want to show you. Um, if you go to the albertamentors.ca website and you click on resources for schools and agencies, if you're interested in, in starting a mentoring program in your high school where high school students mentor elementary school students, we have all kinds of different resources available there, um, including a framework for building mentoring relationships in schools, which is kind of our, it's our cornerstone resource for, uh, for schools and it has many of the checklists and considerations that Kate talked about, about everything from transportation and insurance to space, Mm -hmm. uh, to working with the custodial staff to everything Mm -hmm. else. Like it's a great, uh, it's a great toolkit and checklist. So really check out that framework for building mentoring relationships in schools, as well as the team high school mentoring uh, toolkit. And as well, we've recently just put out a couple more activity guides and and handbooks for that too. So all of this is available for free on www.albertamentors.ca. Of course, our ask is always that you get involved with us and help contribute to the research and help mm-hmm. share it with everyone else around Canada too. So uh, um, with that, I'll turn it over to Kate and Noreen. Any last words, anything else you want to share? Well, just, you should invite us back. Sure, we'd, love to. <laughs> we'd love to. Because this is implementation science. So we're, we're getting in there, we're mucking around, we're seeing what are the facilitators? What, what is re- making this work in communities? What are the barriers? How can those barriers be overcome? So the whole point of the work that we're doing is to make it easier Mm -hmm. uh, for people in the future to apply this program by saying this these are the barriers you may encounter this is how communities are overcoming them Um, this is what made it easy in communities why don't you adopt the same practices so i think in a year or two's time we'll have really exciting information to get back to communities who really want to jump in and do this on their own well, this time next year, then we'll have you back. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sign us up. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Corey, were there any other uh, questions or anything we need to address? No, that's it for now. Excellent. Then uh, we'll thank our presenters very much for coming, and uh, uh, have a great afternoon, everyone.